Hello everyone and welcome to my talk on our paper on the impossibility of purely algebraic signatures. My name is Dominic Hartmann and this is joint work with Nico Döttling, Dennis Hofeins, Eike Kills, Sven Schäge and Bogdan Olsen. So let's get started. Um, we look at digital signatures and as we all know they are an integral part to modern communications and basically ubiquitous. And therefore various uh, assumptions and primitives have been shown to yield digital signatures. Um, for example we know that one-way functions um, are sufficient um, and necessary to build digital signatures and we can also build them from discrete logarithm uh, assumptions and the random oracle model for example Schnorr signatures from pairings uh, like Bonnet Boyen signatures from lattices and random oracles uh, e.g. the construction of Gentry et al and hash functions uh, like Merkle trees and it is uh, always interesting to see which assumptions are actually sufficient to build uh, specific primitives. So what we are looking at is whether just um, a group is enough to actually build signatures because as of uh, right now, there are no constructions from just groups. You always need some additional property like a pairing or a random oracle to achieve signatures. So we asked the question, uh, is this inherent? Can we actually build signatures from just groups? And uh, we prove that for a specific class of uh, natural signatures over groups, this is actually impossible. So what are our contributions? Firstly, we've uh, defined this class of signatures, which we call algebraic signatures over prime order groups, and show that in the generic group model, these signatures can't be secure. Secondly, we define simplified algebraic signatures, which also capture um, hidden order groups, and we show that these uh, simplified algebraic signatures can't be secure even in the standard model. And lastly, we show an application of this whole framework and show that BLS signatures can actually uh, be expressed um, as simplified algebraic signatures if you instantiate them uh, with an algebraic hash function. And uh, therefore, we also show that BLS signatures can't be implemented securely with an algebraic hash function. Okay. So let's get started. Um, how do these algebraic signatures actually look like? Um, because this will be the main focus uh, of this talk. Um, so I'll mainly focus on the prime order group case and just give you the uh, high level idea for the hidden order groups. Um, and uh, I'll just briefly talk about the uh, application in the end. So how do we model signatures over just a group? Because um, it is not so clear uh, how exactly do you prevent an adversary from doing things that are not really allowed or should not be allowed in a group or what these things actually are. So um, a signature that works just over a group should basically only use the group uh, structure and it should also be independent of the group representation because then it could uh, do all sorts of things with this bit representation. For example, hash the group elements or hash into the group. And um, then the security might actually depend on the hash function and not on the group uh, itself. Uh, so especially it should not be allowed to encode some other hard problem into group elements or into the structure of group elements. And of course, we also need a formalization which actually allows for more than just pathological examples. So we need a large class of signatures, otherwise an impossibility result wouldn't really be all that interesting. And uh, it seems that the right abstraction for this is uh, the generic group model, which was introduced by Schub and later um, a different um, definition was given by Maurer. So let me recall the generic group model first. In the generic group model, we idealize uh, a prime order group and um, instead of giving an adversary access to the uh, group representation, it only gets labels for group elements, which themselves don't have any structure and don't help in computing anything about the group. So um, in order to actually use the group, the adversary also needs um, oracles which perform the group operations. And uh, generally in the generic group model, the runtime of an adversary or an algorithm is generally um, measured in the number of group operations that it performs, so Oracle queries. Um, later, our adversary will actually be efficient in terms of group uh, operations, but inefficient outside the groups, the, except, uh, the exact interpretation of that uh, will come later. So keep that in mind. I'll talk about uh, this specific uh, runtime measurement uh, in a bit. 
So as I said, there are two variants of the generic group model, one by Schub and one by Maurer, and they differ in how they uh, assign these labels. In Schub's generic group model, every group element gets uh, a random bit string as a label from some domain that is large enough. While in Maurer's generic group model, the labels are sequential. So whenever um, a new group element is given to the adversary, it just gets the next label, like one, two, three. So they aren't random, they are just completely meaningless, basically, and just uh, a sequence of numbers. So why should we choose one over the other? Well, in Schub's generic group model, we know that this implies signatures. Um, you can actually prove uh, Schnorr signatures secure in this, uh, in this model and uh, it even can be used to build a random oracle. While in Maurer's group model, um, it's not known to imply signatures. So we use Maurer's generic group model because otherwise uh, impossibility results aren't really feasible because we know that there actually are signatures in Schub's generic group model. Okay, now that we know what we can do in this model, um, we can um, talk about how to model uh, algebraic signatures. And the idea is, of course, we have a prime order group G and we need some parameters N, K, L and Kappa. And uh, throughout the rest of this work, we will call the message space uh, capital M. And how does such an algebraic signature now look like? Of course, we have to define key generation, uh, signing and verification. And uh, for key generation, of course, we get a verification key and a secret key. And on the secret key, we don't have any constraints. It's just a bit string. And the verification key consists of n group elements and also some random bit string. Um, and for uh, making it clear, if I'm talking about group elements or exponents, I'll write group elements in these uh, brackets. Um, and whenever I'm talking about exponents, I will leave the brackets out. So. Um, for this verification key, um, if I talk about uh, x without the um, without the brackets, I mean the discrete logarithms of these group elements. Um, but we don't make any constraints on how this key is actually computed. So we just say it, it looks like this, but not how you can compute it. Similarly, for the signing algorithm, we just demand that a signature consists of k group elements and um, some uh, bit string t of length at most kappa. And lastly, the verification algorithm, and here is where we actually do make some constraints. Uh, and uh, that is, we say that the verification is actually just checking linear equations. Namely, we have these matrices A and B, which can depend on S, the mess, um, so the, the bit string from the public key, uh, the message M, and the bit string T from the verification key. And now verification is just uh, checking that uh, a times x is equal to b times y. And note that a and b are actually matrices over zp. And this is because of the generic group model, um, because as I said, we don't want to be able to hash into and out of the group. So um, it, these matrices um, can't uh, create new group elements from s, m, or t. Um, and in the generic group model, we also can't multiply two group elements. So this actually seems to be uh, reasonable constraints in a generic group model to say that we are only allowed to check linear relations um, between the public key elements and the uh, signature group elements. Okay, so for every message, we get different um, matrices and because later in uh, in the security game uh, we only have one public key I will mostly omit the s from the matrices because it will be fixed either way so we can also um, think of it as a function only dependent on m and t and this makes everything a bit shorter um, and notice that the parameters that we uh, defined above so the n k uh, and l are the dimensions of the matrices and we will um, see this later in the performance of our adversary. So now that we have defined how our signatures look like, we also have to define what security we actually prove impossibility for. And since we want to prove an impossibility result, the weaker the notion, uh, the better. So we won't use standard UFCMA security, but uh, UFQ RMA security. And intuitively, this just says that an adversary gets Q signatures on random messages and the verification key 
uh, is not allowed to make any uh, signature queries on chosen messages and in the end has to produce a forgery which of course cannot be contained in the messages that he received in the first place. And obviously this is uh, weaker than uh, the standard UFCMA security. So if we show that even this is impossible, then of course this also implies that UFCMA security is impossible. So it makes our result only stronger. Okay, and now that we have defined how our signatures look like and what security notion we consider, we can actually state the main theorem uh, for generic groups and for prime order groups. Um, and this is our first impossibility result. Namely, if we have an algebraic signature scheme uh, SIG with parameters n, k, l, and kappa, um, then there exists a generic group, adversary A, that breaks the UF NRMA uh, security of this signature scheme uh, with probability 1 over n plus 1. And it only makes a polynomial number of uh, group operation queries, but the additional runtime, so everything else, is exponential in kappa, but polynomial in uh, n, k, l, and uh, the logarithm of the group order. So um, just as a reminder, um, these are the parameters that uh, we consider. So the parameter of the assumption, this n, is the size of the public key, so the width of this matrix, uh, matrix A. And the other parameters, as I said, l and k, um, are seen in the uh, in the other runtime of the adversary. Okay, so now let me give you a overview of how this um, attack actually works. And the main idea uh, is twofold, namely first, the signature verification is public, and also it's a linear equation. So whenever we see uh, a valid signature, this actually tells us something about um, about the verification key or more specifically about the discrete logarithms of the verification key. And um, we can see that if we knew these discrete logarithms, this would also uh, already be enough to compute signatures. And um, we also observe that these um, possible um, verification keys, they form an affine subspace of finite dimension of um, ZP or more precisely the discrete logarithms form this affine subspace. So whenever we see a new signature, one of two things can happen. Um, either we can learn something new about the public key or the discrete logarithms of the public key. And in this case, the dimension of this affine subspace of possible um, uh, public verification keys decreases by at least one. And since this is a finite dimensional subspace, this can only happen uh, a finite amount of time. Or the other case is that the signature doesn't reveal a new constraint. But in this case, a forgery is already possible because then we could just take any um, of the public keys or the discrete logarithms of said public key from the space of possible keys and we could forge with that. Now, the question is, how do we compute this set of possible verification keys with just polynomially many group operations? And if we know this, uh, set, how do we actually check that such a verification key works? Because, as I said before, these matrices A and B depend on M and T. So we have to find uh, a message M and T such that we actually can know whether this uh, public key space that we already know is small enough. And um, these are the two main problems that we have to solve and I'll talk about them one after another. So. First, how can we compute this set of uh, possible public keys? And well, basically the answer is we can't with just polynomially many group operations, but we can compute something that is good enough. Namely, we can compute its dual space. So we don't compute the set of possible public keys. Instead, we compute the space of constraints on this public keys uh, space. So basically we get uh, linear equations of the form um, Z transposed times X. So the discrete logarithms of the public key is equal to zero. And each signature might reveal some of these equations. And these equations also form an affine subspace of uh, Zp to the n. And whenever the um, space of possible public keys would shrink by one, um, the dimension of this uh, dual space increases by one. 
So now instead of having a decreasing um, dimension, we have an increasing dimension, but still the vector space has finite dimension. So uh, at some point uh, we know either the whole space or we know at least enough uh, that we can actually forge a signature. Okay, but still there is the problem that we need to know when we actually have enough information. Um, and how do we find such, uh, such a pair M and T that uh, we actually know enough? And uh, here we see that these, uh, these constraints um, are all in this left kernel. So what we do is we check for a new M and T if this left kernel of the matrix B uh, times A is actually already covered by all the constraints that we have seen before. Uh, so these, uh, these KJs that we uh, defined on the previous slide. And since uh, A and B are ZP matrices and these constraints are also sub, uh, a subspace of uh, ZP to the N, this is checkable without group operations. And uh, we show in our paper that if this, uh, this um, condition uh, holds, then there exists a solution to the verification equation and we can actually find it. I won't go into the technical details there, but it's basically um, just linear algebra using the um, basis uh, extension theorem. Uh, if you want more details, you can look it up in our paper. Okay, so now we can collect these KJs um, by considering the left kernel of the matrices that we get for the signatures that our um, challenger gives us. And for a new message, we can actually check if there is a solution by, um, by using this uh, inclusion in the subspace. So now we can actually show how our adversary works. As in the UFRMA game, it gets N um, signatures on messages M1 to MN. And for each of these messages, we compute this affine subspace of constraints, Ki, and we consider the uh, vector space sum of all of these constraints, which we call Li or Ln for the last of these subspaces. And as I said, these form a rising um, inclusion of uh, subspaces. And then we just take a random message M star. And now we have to try for all possible T um, if um, this left kernel of uh, B of M star T star times A of M star T star is actually in the set of all constraints. And if we don't find such a T, well, then we uh, didn't uh, know enough constraints on uh, the public key yet. And if we do find such a T, then we know that there actually exists a solution to this linear equation system that we need to solve in order to get a signature. And uh, we can actually solve this um, with just polynomially many group operation queries um, because we can compute a weak inverse of B. Um, think about it as just Gaussian elimination. And then we get a solution for this equation system. And since the verification is defined just in a way that this verification equation has to hold, then of course this solution is a valid signature. And we can just output it and the adversary will win. The only thing left to consider now is uh, the probability that uh, such a T star exists or doesn't exist. Um, and this is a simple dimension argument because if we assume that for every message M1 to Mn and M star, the dimension of the uh, constraint space increases by at least one, well then in the end we would have a vector space of dimension um, N plus one, but it is a subspace of Zp to the N which has dimension N, so this can't happen. So there are at least two messages which uh, are subsequent where the dimension does not increase. And since all messages are random uh, with probability at least uh, one over n plus one, this is uh, uh, mn and our message m star. And if that is the case, then there will be such a t star um, and we will be successful. And this is where the success probability of our adversary comes from. Okay. And this is it for um, prime order groups. Um, now, as I said, onto the interpretation. Um, the attack that I just described is only pseudo-efficient. That is, it needs polynomially many group operations, but it is exponential um, in kappa for operations outside of the group because it has to brute force 
search over all possible strings t. So this is an efficient attack as long as this kappa is small or there is some smart way of finding t star um, which is not exponential. Of course this might not always be the case but there are two other possibilities namely either kappa is large and t star is hard to find even with the secret key but if that would be the case well then even an honest signer that knows the secret key wouldn't be able to reliably find it and then he couldn't produce valid signatures and then the signature scheme simply wouldn't be correct so this is unlikely and um, the other option is that kappa is large and t star is only easy to find with the secret key which is some arbitrary bit string but then the security of the signature scheme relies on finding a suitable t star and then it must rely on some other hardness assumption which is somehow encoded in this bit string in the secret key. So by ignoring uh, the computation that we do outside the group what we actually do is something similar to an impagliazzo rudic style oracle separation. There um, the adversary is uh, normally provided with an oracle of the um, assumption that we think um, uh, is not sufficient to show something and a p-space oracle which allows it to solve all other problems. Basically also there the interpretation is that this uh, p-space oracle allows it to bypass all other external hardness assumptions and only focus on the hardness of this um, assumption that you get an oracle for and we do um, almost the same here it's just that we don't give a p-space oracle but we say that our adversary is uh, unbounded outside of our uh, generic group. So even though this doesn't necessarily give you a concrete attack on such signature schemes, it is still a reasonable um, attack for an impossibility result. Okay, now on to hidden order groups. Um, and the core idea here is similar, but there are some new challenges. Because first of all, we can't compute inverse group elements or rather we can't compute inverse exponents. Um, and since we need to invert these matrices to do Gaussian elimination and they consist of exponents, we can't do this because we don't know the group order. So this doesn't work. And additionally, there is no generic group model for hidden order groups. So the whole uh, Oracle separation approach also doesn't really apply. So we have to make some simplifications and come up with different ways to show impossibilities here. And this is where the definition of simplified algebraic signatures comes in. Um, now we define everything over a group of potentially unknown order n, and we only have parameters n, k, and l. And key generation and uh, signing is similar, but we um, omit the bit strings. For the verification here, this isn't actually a constraint because uh, now we actually get the representation of the group elements, so we could encode this string s into the group elements. For the signature, this is actually a constraint because this string uh, t was uh, an important part of the previous uh, definition, and here we don't have it, so this is why these are simplified algebraic signatures. And the verification equation then, of course, also is simplified. Um, now a only depends on the verification key and m because we don't have t, and b can only depend on the verification key and not on uh, the message which is um, a constraint on the proof uh, that we use later. So here's also a small simplification. Note, however, that A and B depend on the whole verification key and not just on some bit string, because as I said, we are not in a generic uh, model, um, but the adversary gets to see also the representation and can actually use it. Okay, so let me state the impossibility result for these simplified algebraic signatures. And it is actually pretty similar to the previous one. Um, again, let SIG be a simplified algebraic signature scheme with parameters as before. Over group G, this time of potentially unknown order, and now we are in the standard model. So we say that now there exists a polynomial time adversary in the dimensions of the matrices. Um, and this uh, adversary wins the UFQS RMA game with probability one over qs plus one. So again, the probability of winning uh, corresponds to the um, parameter of the assumption. And here qs is uh, larger than before, namely it is uh, n times l squared times t max, where t max is polynomial in um, 
the logarithm of the group order times uh, the size of the public key plus the message length. It's still all polynomial, but it uh, has to be a bit larger because uh, now instead of working over a field, uh, we work over the integers and there we have to bound the size that the integers, integers might take. And to do this efficiently, um, we have to use more signatures. And um, what is the proof idea here? Similar as before, we want to combine previous signatures um, into a new signature. And due to the constraints, we can just do linear combinations of previously seen signatures. This is why this matrix B can only depend on the verification key and not on the message. But as I said, the problem is now we have to work over the integers because in an unknown order group, we can't invert, so we can't work over it um, as a regular vector space or field. And the main tool to uh, solve this is the so-called Hermite normal form, uh, short HNF. And um, if we compute this over the matrices um, A of B, K, M, I for all the M, I for enough signatures in a specific form, which I won't go into detail here, then we can use this to find a linear combination of uh, this uh, A, V, K, M star. Um, and we can do this efficiently. And uh, this uh, HNF has some nice uh, properties, which allows us to um, accurately bound the number of signatures that we actually need um, with a similar dimension argument and uh, some properties of the HNF. So as I said, um, we also um, s uh, cover uh, BLS signatures. And for this, we define plain algebraic signatures, um, which also include pairings. Um, although they are pretty much tailor-made to the um, setting with algebraic hash functions. Um, and I won't go into the details here. If you want to uh, learn more, then um, you can look at our paper. And then we uh, apply our impossibility results um, for simplified algebraic signatures to these uh, plain algebraic signatures in the standard model. And of course, there are still some open questions. Um, as I said, algebraic signatures are um, a bit limited. Um, for example, we don't consider inequalities because they could also be checked in a generic group model. And another open question is, can we remove the simplifications we made in the hidden order group setting? Um, and of course, similar results for um, short purely hash-based signatures would also be interesting because now we talked about uh, signatures just from groups and we know that with groups and random oracles or hash functions in general, we can build short signatures, but from groups we can't and from hashes we only know long signatures. So this would also be an interesting question. Thank you all for your attention. And um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them at the conference. Bye.